Well, it's great to welcome John and Andy. And uh, um, just we're here to just chat a little bit about where the culture's at, where evangelism's at. And I just wanted to start, John, with the conference you gave us um, uh, back in October, our evangelism conference at All Souls, where you talked about story and narrative. Why do you think it's so powerful in the culture at the moment? Why do we need to have an ear to that in terms of what's going on? Well, thanks, Rico. Um, I think that we are clearly a culture that loves stories. You only have to see the amount of time that people invest in watching box sets on Netflix or Amazon mm. Prime, films, books. So stories are very much part of our culture. People yeah. love engaging um, uh, with uh, stories. Um, and the Bible would tell us actually that, that the whole gospel is basically a story about what God yeah. has done to save and rescue people. And unlike propositions, which just seem rather abstract, um, yeah. stories enable you to enter in as a whole person into events, emotions, and relationships. So people engage with stories. They love the people who feature in stories. They love the drama of unfolding events. And uh, I think God created us as human beings to both live in a story and to enjoy stories. And therefore, it's a very effective and different way of communicating the gospel. I think I would say that actually after the Enlightenment, with the rise of reason, um, our, our culture did take a turn away from stories and away from emotion to propositions. Mm. And I think we're beginning to recover something of the holistic approach of who we are as human beings. And maybe Christians have been slower to catch up with that than other elements of our culture that have seen the importance of story. Tell me, your mum, she was involved with, what was, because I remember when you came and spoke, you talked about your mum's work and how she sort of predicted this would happen. Yeah, my mum had been involved in market research, um, which yeah. was uh, kind of assessing the effectiveness of advertising. Yeah. And I think she was just aware of a significant change in the 1980s, where adverts moved from telling you about a product and what it does, to um, telling a story about the product and how the product connects with your life. So I remember she was involved in road testing the kind of gold blend advert where it shifted from speaking about the coffee to having a couple, and it was primarily focused on their relationship. It was really a mini soap opera, yeah. but the coffee featured within their story. And it was almost a seminal moment in which advertising changed from selling you the product and telling you what the benefits of the product were to putting the product in a life story. And the product wasn't directly spoken about, but it, 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 it subliminally connected the life of these individuals with the coffee that they were enjoying. And I think we now see that all the way around us. Many adverts today, you hardly have any idea what the product is. It's basically presenting you a story, and then you're meant to connect the product yeah. with, the, with the story. And it's an emotion that goes with it as well, isn't it? Pe people pick up the emotion that comes from the story, not necessarily the facts. And a good emotion tying into a good story is incredibly powerful and it strikes me that's the way the world's been operating today in the last 10 years in particular. Numbers of groups are telling their stories and they're coming over as better stories than, uh, than we've been telling. Yeah. And I think story helps shape our whole worldview and our thinking. There's an interconnection between story, ideas and emotions. So for example, we as a, a British nation, we have a story about ourselves. It's quite interesting that two of the big films of the last year were Dunkirk and The Darkest Hour. And I think we have a national narrative about Britain, its role in the world, its place at the beginning of the Second World War. And that shapes our understanding of who we are. It shapes how we see others. It shapes what we think is most important. It gives us our identity. And we find those things in stories. I think one of the mistakes Christians make is we're, un we're uncomfortable with the word story because it sounds as though it's something made up. So for many of us, the word yeah, story absolutely. sounds like it's a fiction. Um, it's perhaps better to think of um, events and relationships unfolding in real time. That's what a story is. The story is an unfolding of events and relationships and the emotions that go with them. And it can be either factual or fiction. So we might talk about the Dunkirk story. Now, it's real events that took place, but it's about relationships, events, and emotions that are connected with those. So we mustn't get distracted just by the word story, as if that means something equivalent to myth. I mean, that's sort of key question, I guess. If we're, if we're trying to win the millennials, what do you think their take is on this? I mean, how is, 
here we are, we're sitting here, we're, we're, we're thinking, okay, um, we know there's a, a drought of people coming uh, under 35. Is there something here we particularly need to be thinking about? I was going to say, I think stories have been told about us. Yeah. So, so if you go to the millennials and you ask, what do you think about Christians? There is no way that you could be a, a Christian because the story is Christians are brain dead. Mm. They are homophobic, they're transphobic, mm. and they, are, they have no insight into the world as it is. Mm. And we've been silent. We haven't been speaking positively. We haven't been countering those images. The reality is that Christians do some brilliant things in some brilliant yeah. areas, but we have not been telling uh, the stories nor even the yeah. big story that John's been um, alluding to, we've become the victim of our own passivity. You see, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I always think that when you're, when I, I was at the same school as Alan Turing, so the guy who uh, did the Enigma machine and, and, you know, maybe saved 40 million lives and shortened the war by two years. And, but of course, he was pursued to his death, really. By 1954, he was dead because he, he was a, a, a homosexual and a practicing homosexual. And and actually, uh, what, what I always think is it's learning that thing of realizing people are rebels. Alan Turing made wrong choices, mm. but at the same time, he's a victim. And we as a church haven't necessarily heard that story. So to hear that story and be able to understand, is that right? That people are victims as well as rebels and yet, and teach our people to discern the two, teach others to, is that? I think that is exactly right. It says sin is enslaving. Sin is both wrongdoing, but it's also enslaving. Yeah. And the Bible would talk about sin not just as wrong things we do that deserve God's judgment, but as being in slavery to Satan and his rule over it. Mm -hmm. I think that aspect of the human condition is one that evangelicals have tended to underplay yeah. in favour of a kind of a legal, juridical model of the guilt that comes from sin. And it's not that it's either or, it's actually both and in the Bible. Yeah. And sin has all of those dimensions. So yes, um, uh, people are both um, wicked perpetrators, but they're actually also uh, victims uh, who have been enslaved. Uh, the gospel frees from both. Um, and we need to be able to, in a sense, speak of sin and its consequences in that holistic um, uh, yeah, way. It's, it's interesting, on Life Explored, every week with the little film we've done, which opens up, which is the film of different lives, we basically are doing each week, look, can you see you're in the pigsty? So we've taken the most famous short story and said, look, you're in a pigsty and can you see the famine coming? So we're, we're praying that people who come and see these silent movies will see themselves with the good things they worship becoming God things and destroying them. So it's that sense of it being enslaving and hoping people will say, gosh, that's what this is doing. Now then we are desperate to get people to see, look, this is all a subsection of being a rebel against God, and you need to seek his forgiveness. But the way in yeah. is idolatry, not law-breaking. Yeah. And part of the way in, also with the story, is that we are made in the image of God. We know we are made for something more. There is an ache within the human soul, and people are asking questions. They are expecting things that the world isn't delivering. Yeah. And so we see them getting answers at times in the wrong places. And we immediately go in and say, that's wrong rather than say, let's honour the question, the que let's start with the question, let's start with the ache that they've got, and, and, and let's work that out. Because yes, we are made for something bigger and better, and that is only going to find its satisfaction in Christ. But let's be gracious enough and merciful enough that we start with the questions they are asking, rather than the decisions they make, the wrong decisions they make, in the light of those questions. I think uh, one of the illustrations of the difference between story and proposition and how that works out, actually the recent debate on abortion in the Irish Republic yeah. is classic of that. Those who wanted to retain the restrictions on abortion generally made reasoned propositional arguments. Life begins at conception, it's wrong to have abortions. Those who were in favour of introducing changes in abortion generally told the stories of women who had been pregnant, maybe those who had been raped, those who had children with very significant sort of medical conditions that meant that they could not survive. And it was then communicated around the pain of those individual circumstances. Mm. And I think in the cultural argument, those stories were far more winning than the logical proposition.
of what you might believe about how life begun. And I think sometimes as Christians, we come across simply communicating the logical proposition. Mm. So I've got a millennial and, I, I'm, and I'm sort of thinking, gosh, they're just turned, they're not even considering because of the stories they've been taught. Guys, what, what do you, it, so, say, say this is a, a godchild I've got or a nephew, uh, um, how, would you, how would you go forward? I mean, w- w- would there be a website you'd send? I mean, how would you say, look, I think you've heard the wrong story. What would, just give us a strategy. I do wonder, because it, it was an Iron Bevin, I think, who had the great phrase, this is my truth, tell me yours, that we now live in an age in which there is an entitlement for us to tell our story. And I don't think our people necessarily tell their story that well. I think, as John was suggesting, they can go straight to proposition and it can seem quite dull and dusty and removed. Mm. But I think when we've learned to tell our story, which of course is what the Apostle Paul did, on numerous occasions, tailoring it appropriately to his audience. When we can tell our story, maybe when we've discerned the connection that there may be with our listener, we need to do that a lot better Mm. because people aren't going to say to you in today's culture, that's rubbish. They will honour you for your story. So let's, I'm not saying this is the complete answer at all, but I'm saying part of it is that we should be able briefly, without cliche, to tell our stories in winsome ways. And you see what's interesting with Talking Jesus, which has really struck me, this um, uh, uh, survey that's been done with Mm. Hope UK and the Anglican Church and the Evangelical Alliance, is that, you know, 67% of people in this country have a Christian friend they like. And what's the story about that Christian friend? Oh, they're selfless. Well, that's amazing. And, and yet, I think a lot of Christians, when I do evangelism training, I say, what percentage of people in this country have got a Christian friend they like? They go, mm, 15%. So they've heard that same story of we're ineffective, we're not having an impact. And I, I start those training sessions by saying, guys, you're doing great. People, are, you're really living differently. And the neighbors like it. They might not like what, they, what, what you think, but they do like how you live. So it's having a confidence, again, in the, the story that we are telling in our lives, which is one of selflessness and service. I look at my church family at All Souls. They humble me at the way in which they just give themselves. They could cross the pain line a bit more on the evangelism front, but I can tell you what, they are, I mean, they are remarkable in terms of just loving other people. I think as, evangel- as evangelicals, we've fallen into the danger of thinking that people will be converted quickly. I think that's because much of our history is of bringing the gospel to people who were already in a Christian culture. And we were effectively encouraging people to believe what they already ought to have believed. Mm. Uh, And actually, some of the models in the New Testament of rapid conversion, Paul preaching, Pentecost, Mm. they are the gospel going to people who are committed Jews in the synagogue or or God-fearers. And therefore, it's not surprising that they became Christians quite quickly. It was the fulfillment of what they were expecting Mm. anyway. But actually, even in the New Testament, when the gospel goes to those who are pagans who have no Christian background, often it takes much longer. Mm. So Paul hires a lecture hall in Ephesus, and he lectures yeah, day after yeah, day after yeah. day. So I think if you've got your friend or your godchild or whatever who has little Christian background, we mustn't expect that one conversation is probably going to... It could do in God's mercy, but it's probably not going to. Most people's conversion story is quite a long process. Mm of having the gospel brought to bear on them. And I think as we engage with somebody in that situation, we need to start by remembering what's the story they've heard? What's the story they're believing? And then we need to subvert that story. We need to help them to critique it because the point of stories in the culture is they're taken on board unthinkingly and everybody assumes that those stories are true and are real. And we need to find ways of making them see the, the problems with the story. And then in its place, telling the different story of Jesus himself. And obviously evangelism in the end is ultimately about declaring who Jesus is and what he's done. It's telling his story. And then alongside that, we need to show them the story of what difference Jesus makes. Because I think for many people at root, they think Christianity has nothing to offer. They don't think it will solve the real problems they've got. And so what they actually need to see is the story in action. And in my experience, that is often the route for many people's conversions. The, the conversion story I come across again and again in churches is, is a person in the church, and I'll ask them, how did you become a Christian? And it usually starts with, I knew a Christian. Mm. 
They were a neighbour, a friend, a family member. They talked to me about Jesus. I saw something different about them. Then at some point they invited to, some, to me to something at church, an event, a service, a carol service. Quite often the person will then say, I went to church and I had all these sorts of expectations, but when I arrived it was totally different from what I expected. Um, the people weren't like what I expected and the way they related to each other was radically different. And I found myself attracted to it. And I found myself wanting to come back. And then I started coming back. And then they gradually engage with the message that's being heard. Often they undertake a course or read the Bible with someone. They become intrigued. And quite often I've found that they've reached a point at which they've become a Christian, but they haven't quite realized they've become a Christian yet. And I think one of the things we've lost confidence is actually the distinctive difference of most real Christian communities. We're used to being embarrassed by church. And that's because as Christians, when we're in the church community, we see all its flaws. But the new person who comes in actually sees something of the loving life. And that's often a very powerful way in which the story of Jesus is made real for them. It's interesting. My nephews just started working at All Souls and having had a pretty tough few years at university. And I mean, he's just, it's amazing. to it, I, It's helped me see my church in a new light, a kinder light, actually, because I see him going, actually, he says to me, Rico, these people are lovely. They're really kind. And I'm going, oh. you know, but you forget, don't you? You forget that they are, they are led by, by Christ and his spirit. Yeah. I think of my own small church family and many other churches that I know, and there are not many communities in which you have such a range of people who are so diverse, different ages, yeah different educational backgrounds, different interests. In the human world, they wouldn't get on with one another. They wouldn't meet Mm -hmm. together. They wouldn't connect. And yet, as the church, there is a love for each other. And I think Jesus' comment about sort of, by this they'll know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. In diverse church communities, that that is seen in practice in a way that we don't, I think, realize.